Hello, dear friends. We're giving you a couple of seconds to connect. Welcome to Digital Ship VPO webinar. Today we are, with, we are discussing how Audiapel and Storm Geo moves forward with maritime de decarbonization. Let me welcome our guest speakers, Einstein Jensten, uh, Chief Sustainability Officer of Audiapel, and Patty Lung, Managing Director of Greater China from Storm Geo. This webinar is sponsored also by Storm Geo, and we encourage you to ask a lot of questions. We will start off with some insights from Carl Jeffrey, founding editor of Digital Ship, who also edits the Tanker Operator magazine. Let's go, Carl. Thank you. So what we're going to look about today is uh, two ways we can move towards forwards on decarbonization. There's two groups we need to get on board. One is the investors and one is the seafarers. So we're going to look at how we can do more to get the investors and the seafarers on board or help with digital technology. And it sounds like two very separate talks, but we're going to connect them both together. So on the financial side, we're going to start with the shipping and terminal company Odfiel, which is based in Bergen. And uh, they've done, a, I'm sorry, I've just uh, done something silly with my computer. They've, uh, so they've, uh, they've recently announced some ambitious climate targets, and they demonstrated their commitments to these targets by linking them to financing in the industry's first sustainable linked bond. So ex to explain what that means, the, uh, the investors in the bonds get a return, which is related to whether or not the target's met. So we're going to hear more about this from Einstein Jensen, who's the Chief Sustainability Officer of Oddfjell. So he's going to explain the background and he's going to explain Oddfjell's broad approach to decarbonisation and sustainability. And he's also going to explain Oddfield's thinking on achieving the ambitious climate targets from an operational and technical perspective and how data and digitalization is going to be vital to getting that done. And he's also going to explain some of the other benefits the company got from doing these sustainable bonds because they attracted new capital and uh, other benefits from sustainable financing. So secondly, we're going to look on the seafarer and psychological side. So Petty Lung, who's Managing Director of Greater China from Storm Geo, based in Hong Kong, is going to talk about the digital tools seafarers can use on board. And she's going to address some common perceptions seafarers have. So they believe they can't make any difference to the vessel's emissions. They believe that reducing emissions isn't their main objective. And they believe that the efforts they make are not going to be measured. And so nobody else is going to notice. So she's going to show how if you've got better quality data, that's going to make a difference to all of these things. So high resolution weather data, which can optimize the voyage for fuel consumption or data collected during the voyage and is going to provide insights on the right time to do maintenance tasks. So these two talks are links because Oddfjell is a client of Storm Geo and Oddfjell will also show how they're using the Storm Geo technology. We're going to have uh, two 15 minute presentations and then we're going to have lots of time for questions. So I'd like to invite Mr. Jensen to give the opening talk. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Carl. I uh, hope you can see, uh, see the slides. Yep. Uh, now uh, and thank you for the uh, introduction uh, there was a lot uh, and uh, so it's a uh, kind of a challenge to try to cover everything in a in, in a very short uh, short period of time so uh, i'll uh, be quite brief uh, on some of these topics um, and um, let uh, and we can see maybe jump back to it uh, during the q a session uh, so, um, uh, quickly on uh, on Oddfjell, for those of you that uh, do not know the company, we uh, we are an uh, old company. We have a history of more than 106 years. We uh, are specialized in the seaborne transportation of storage of chemicals. Uh, so, uh, we transport anything liquid uh, around the world, and, and we also transport those uh, liquids uh, that uh, anyone else is struggling to carry with our specialized uh, vessels. So we're listed as, uh, at the Oslo Stock Exchange. Um, so we operate about 90 of these large vessels. Uh, and I say about because this uh, changes uh, uh, frequently with, uh, with the numbers of ship uh, within, our, uh, within our fleet. But around 90 and, and our, our goal is to move to, to, to 100 vessels. Uh, we also invested in, in tank terminals, uh, and we have tank terminals in five hubs uh, uh, around the world, and, and these are also storing chemicals. So, um, 
I'll talk about shipping today. So shipping uh, performs about 80% of the global trade. And you will see on the right-hand side, you will see just a snapshot of the, <clears throat> of the shipping activity that moves around the world. And that should be no surprise to anyone, uh, the complexity and volume of, of shipping. Uh, it is the most environmentally friendly way of transport uh, uh, to, and, and, and uh, to transport goods over large distances. And, and the challenge is that there are no other alternative than uh, doing that with a conventional uh, combustion engine if you want to transport uh, large uh, volumes over large distances. So shipping will be uh, a key role uh, in developing uh, economic prosperity going forward. But uh, today, shipping emits almost 2.9% of the global CO2 around the world. So shipping is a part of the problem. But given that shipping is also the most environmentally friendly way of transporting uh, material over big distances, it is also a part of the solution. So uh, if you are looking at the sort of the problem side is that they, we see that it is a strong correlation uh, about the global, uh, the rise of temperature uh, and the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. And that was the basis for both the Kyoto Protocol uh, and also the agreement that was done in Paris in 2015. So shipping was not included, directly included in that uh, agreement at that time. But we saw in 2018, the IMO uh, came up with their strategy uh, on uh, reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And we want to reduce greenhouse gas emissions because uh, the, uh, the, the increase in temperature uh, and will develop uh, changes in climate and, and climate change will be uh, and it will and is one of the uh, major challenges for our uh, industry and for the globally uh, that we see today. Uh, the World Economic Forum uh, presented uh, recently in advance of the Davos top meeting, uh, again, their annual risk uh, assessment. And the top uh, five risks are related to sustainability and the top uh, uh, risk and the long-term risk is climate change. So this is something uh, that we need to address and IMO is also addressing this challenge. So uh, if uh, we uh, look at this, um, if you take a look at the, um, the, the graph on the left-hand side, that's a historical slide and, and tells you about the the volume and increase of seaborne trade. And that has been growing uh, tremendously since 1990s until the day where, uh, until where we are today. And we see the projection uh, of uh, uh, the demand for seaborne trade going forward is still increasing. So uh, if we are not doing anything, uh, we will see the uh, volume of CO2 uh, will, will still increase uh, dramatically. Um, we saw that the, there was a dip around the financial crisis, but uh, the demand has really come up again. And if we look at the emissions uh, and we look at the intensity emissions, which is the yellow lines on the uh, graph to the left, we see that they are coming down. But the major reason why they are coming down is that we are building bigger ships. Uh, so that means that the absolute numbers are coming up. Uh, so if we go to the graph on the right hand side, we will see that there's the target for IMO. From 2023, they will, uh, they will start implementing a new regulation with regards to a design index. That's a kind of a, a technical index for, uh, uh, for um, existing ships. And there will be requirements of adjusting uh, the capacity and index for the different vessels. Uh, from 2000, up to 2030, the IMO stated that their target or what they call the level of ambition would be to reduce carbon intensity with 40%. But uh, by re re reducing the intensity, you can re reduce the intensity by uh, building bigger ships. So that means that the absolute numbers, they can still remain and probably will not go down too much, uh, even with a reduction of 40%. So that's why I more said that, well, in 2050, we need to reduce the absolute numbers compared to 2008 uh, with 50%. So in order to achieve that, you would probably reduce the uh, intensity with more than 70, 80, probably 90% in order to achieve a 50% uh, absolute numbers. So what we did is that we uh, 
did a, a thorough analysis of our fleet and looked at our cap uh, capacity and capability and our performance so far compared to 2008 and saw that it was possible for us to set the target to reduce the intensity with more than 40 percent so that's why we set the target of 50 percent and in order to achieve a 50% uh, reduction uh, as the IMO target, we set the target that we want to be uh, climate neutral in 2050. So this, we did that uh, last year. Uh, and, um, and those targets uh, were communicated last year and, uh, and uh, they go beyond the IMO target. I'm very pleased to see that the US uh, came up last week and, and, and also announced that, that they would push the IMO uh, to, um, to zero emission on 2050 as well. So that will be interesting to see the developments when IMO is preparing their new strategy from 2023 and going forward. So these are the uh, climate targets that we set. Uh, and uh, basically, uh, we want to reduce the carbon intensity with 50% uh, in 2030, and we want to be climate neutral in 2050. So what we did is that we looked at uh, possible possibilities for uh, for financing, and uh, we linked those uh, those targets, basically this target uh, of a fifty percent reduction of uh, of the carbon intensity to financing, uh, and uh, we made a sustainable financing framework, and. Uh, in this framework, uh, we will use a KPI related to the carbon intensity of the controlled fleet, uh, the fleet that we, that, that we control. So that does not include uh, char time chartered vessels. Uh, so the uh, sustainability performance target uh, is, uh, is related to an achievement of the AER uh, index. Uh, and um, uh, there will be an annual verification of the KPIs that we have actually achieved this. So the characteristics of this loan and, 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 uh, and bond uh, framework uh, will be that the performance will be linked to the margin of the loan. So it's a proposed step down uh, or a step up, uh, whether we achieve those, that target uh, or not. Uh, so uh, we have also issued uh, loans and bonds under this framework, and I'm coming back to the performance of that later. Uh, and uh, there is a small difference in the mechanism, but basically we are awarded if we achieve that target uh, of following the trajectory. So we need to report on that uh, every year. So um, uh, and uh, this framework and also the reporting will be externally verified. So we have had DNV coming in and support us and doing that verification. So uh, how do we want to achieve these targets? Well, we can do this. Uh, we will do this through technical measures and retrofits, uh, everything from propeller and engine and gearing and a lot of those uh, we have already implemented on existing fleet. We will do uh, a continuous fleet renewal. We have done a, a lot of, uh, a we have recently completed a major fleet renewal for, for all field going forward. Um, that have put us in a, in a good position with where, where we are with regards to the uh, emissions and a modern fleet. And uh, so these will be the measures that we are uh, going to do for 2030, uh, focusing on operational and digitalization. And for 2050, we have to do something else. Then we have to be carbon neutral and we have to be zero emission. So uh, with the interest of time, I, I will focus here uh, a bit on uh, the operational side and also on the digitalization side, what we are doing and what we are thinking and how this uh, matters uh, will be a part of the um, actions that we do in order to achieve the targets. So uh, this is an example uh, of, um, of operational matter that we do. Uh, this is weather routing. Um, we uh, get support from, uh, from Storm, and uh, I'll give you an example of that later, uh, how we are rerouted uh, compared to the original plan. Uh, and uh, when we are talking about saving here, that's the, this is the saving compared to the original plan proposed by the captain. And uh, this is the saving that's been done when the route has been optimized by, by, by Storm. So looking at the numbers from 2016 to 2020, uh, we have about 4,000, 4,500 routes that has been rerouted or, or routed by, by Storm. We have uh, saved 343 days, uh, so, so a year uh, of shipping. 
um, with, with doing that. Uh, we have saved 9,000 tons of fuel and we have reduced the CO2 emissions with 28,000 tons. So when we are talking about savings and time here, so, so this is a little bit technical, but because we, we will use that time saved in, in increased trading days, but that will again uh, improve the efficiency. So the absolute numbers will still be there, but uh, the, uh, we, 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 will do, uh, we can do our trades and, uh, and, uh, and journeys much more efficient. So what we do is that we are, uh, so uh, we, um, with help from Storm, we are routed through more optimized uh, routes with better weather uh, using currents, et cetera. So just the next couple of examples. Uh, here we have the captain uh, on the left-hand side uh, intended a, a shortest distance. Uh, we got uh, support from Storm and I suggested a, a route, uh, a northerly route here um, that will be more favorable with regards to the current. Um, this saved us 22 hours or 20, 35,000 tons in bunkers and also uh, equivalent in, in reduced emission. On the right hand side, we saw that uh, we did the same. Uh, we saved about 16 hours, uh, $18,000 in saving in fuel and also reduced emissions. So these are the kind of operational uh, matters and operational activities that we do in order to optimize how we operate our fleet. And, uh, and with a lot of vessels, uh, this will in the end be a lot of uh, fuel saved, a lot of days saved, and a lot of CO2 saved and improved efficiency of the fleet. So uh, I'll finish off with, with a couple of reflections with regards to optimization and digitalization. So one of the keys uh, to how we have been able to reduce the CO2 footprint of our fleet so far has been that we have done a done. I would say we have done a good job. Uh, we have the we have the uh, we have the um, great fortune of having a, a, a quite big organization uh, with a lot of experts that are able to process, collect, uh, collect and process data and, and improve the data quality. So when we are doing technical retrofits, we are, this is done on a, on a uh, high analytical uh, and, and well, well decided uh, on, on, a, on a good decision based on the data and high quality data. So, um, we see that uh, and the way we are operating uh, that the access to the de to the data uh, will give us tremendous opportunities um, but if we look at our industry today uh, i think we will see that most most data are are locked down in silos uh, they are related to the engine they are to the performance to the pumps to the navigation uh, and, uh, and those data, they are not really shared. Uh, and uh, in our industry, we don't, we don't like to share either. Uh, so we're talking about sharing be between industries and also that we are able to, within the company, to share the data from different silos, from the di uh, different operational technical equipments. So the industry has done a lot. Uh, we have done a great developments, but I think that we're still missing to see the big iPhone moment uh, of our industry, a true springboard into the digital transformation. So going forward, uh, I think that we will uh, need to see that we are able to, to connect the source data into the consumer data that enables the organization to use the, those data, to innovate from it, to create value from it and improve the efficiency and, and then improve sustainability. So uh, the EU is talking about the twin transition going forward. We're talking about the green transition of decarbonization, but we're talking also about the digital transformation. And those two goes hand in hand. So we need to break down those silos that's within the all the technical data. Uh, we need to liberate those data. Uh, we need to make it available and also see the value of it. We, and we also let, uh, have to let computers do what computers are good at. So I think that technology and digitalization are vital to achieve the global sustainability goals going forward. And um, um, with that, I'll, um, I'll uh, give the floor back to, uh, back to you, Carl. Well, that was 
fascinating how all this stuff connects together. <laughs> There's a lot of challenges there. So now we're going across to Wan Chai in Hong Kong. So I'd like to welcome Petty Lung, who's the Managing Director of Greater China for Storm Geo, who's going to talk about digital tools which seafarers can use on board. And as you can see, all this is uh, connecting together in ways which we haven't really explored before. So I'd like to welcome Petty. Thank you. Hello, it's one wonderful that we can be connected to many places. So good morning and good afternoon, depends on where you come from. And thank you, uh, Kao and Vida for uh, hosting the seminar. And uh, Winsign is uh, kind enough to share some of the examples that we've actually do for, uh, uh, for Oddfield. But for full, uh, full disclosure, what I have, I'm presenting those, those examples are actually real life cases of some Jewish customers. But um, so let me share my screen and get started. So I wanted to um, also talk a lot about uh, talk a lot about, about the um, global global. Um, from the company side of perspective. So what I wanted to do is to zoom in to the operational perspective, because I think the uh, men and women in the, in the, in the front line, in uh, the seafarers, are the one who have the big task of uh, the decarbonization. So- We can't um, see your screen actually. Did you mean to- Oh, sorry. Am I in? Yep, yep, that's right. <laughs> okay, talk about technology. So um, I'm I'm talk, talking about like uh, from the perspective of the men and women on the front line, how they are executing the voyage in order to um, to fulfill the our mission of decarbonization. So um, talking about people, then we need to have incentive and motivation, and besides that, we also need to have tools. And then, so I will explore a little bit about this using some live examples, and then to sum up with the factors for successes. So on, in terms of motivation, I think for the operators and the owners, the incentives are very clear. So we are talking about a sustain, sustainable environment leading to a compliance of many regulations, and then to become more competitive competitive. So there was also a link to the financing. So there was really a big financial incentive. But for the men and women in the front line, are they on board? So I think a lot of the a lot of the um, sentiment that I gathered over the years is a lot of seafarers feels that they don't feel that they can make a difference. And also Reducing emission is really not their first objective because they are in charge of the ship, the safety of the ship and cargo and also the crew. So they need to move from A to B safely, efficiently. And so even if they have done something, so, so maybe nobody noticed they cannot be measured. So that is sort of kind of broad sentiment of a lot of the um, people I met. So. I like to use a few examples that are the people who make the exception, or uh, maybe more and more people are making this exception. And once I sh share two routes that we have done in terms of saving, but I'm now sharing one which is very, very short. I know that uh, for the Hong Kong, uh, for the China and Australia trade, at one point it was the most popular trade in this area. So we're talking about a very short route, which is from Australia to Taiwan. So the original track, which is uh, labeled the yellow ship, and that is passing from the east coast of Australia to Capricorn Island, and then pass through the Joe Mart entrance, and then the PNG, and then go to Taiwan. So this has been decided as the route. But um, for the 
captain on board the ship, they were actually for this short route, they just don't set auto, like set all the voyage plan and not changing it. So the ship sailed on the 21st of February, on the 24th, the three days later, the master is actually looking at the weather data from one of our tools and then seeing that if they have somehow deviated further yeast, so you see that the yellow ship was the original intended, the red ship is, is the deviated route. So, so that he feels that it could um, avoid the adverse current, adding a small distance to it. So then, then he did, did that. And a few days later, the ships actually also, the masters, part, uh, that is when he already in the northeast of PNG. And then he's detecting some good favorable current to the west. So he has decided to change the route. So what was the result of this? The result was um, the, the compared with what he originally intended, he actually saved a six tons of six tons of um, you have a few oils, so that was approximately about 18 tons of CO2. So you may think that this is very small, but then imagine how many voyages are short voyages. So if we make a small difference in all the occasion, they all add up. Plus, if you have um, remember Einstein's example on the uh, northeast coast of Africa, there is all this current. But in fact, all those areas with the air orange and yellow current, they are heavy, sometimes as heavy as three to four knots. So if you can either uh, avoid it or ride along to it, depends on your on which direction you travel to. So this is the force of nature, you can save CO2, save money and don't cost you anything. So that was one example of an incentive by the people on board the ship. And the second one is some of the traditional thinking, especially in container ship, because the container ship has the number crit critical mission is the ETA integrity. So they need to arrive at a particular place within one or two hours. So um, the traditional thinking is, they can't be late, so I better hurry up at the beginning. So if you look at this chart, the gray, small gray patches, they are the AIS position. And then the red, red cross is the noon position that's reported by the ship. But actually, if you notice the blue line, which is the recommended speed that, that is recommended to the ship. And so and a very faint line of blue, that is the weather. So you see that the captain was not following the recommended. It was going very fast for the first five days and then going slow, slow down because he knows that now he can make the, make the ET, ETA. So compare with something like this that I've just, the graph that just flashed up. So they very follow the recommended uh, speed and consumption. So the result really is if you look at our rough estimate so rough estimate of 116 tons of fuel more, even though it's only a few days of speeding, speed up. So you see, this is not small differences anymore. So I think managing the speed, and I, I could say that over the years, this situation has become less and less, but they're still happening. So these are the mindset that we need to change. And so, um, for the two examples I share was how the people in the ship use the, uh, use the routing. But on, in tops, on tops of that now, we have um, one, of the, one of the contention is, um, so what, if I have not done anything, nobody can see it. If I've done something, nobody also, nobody can see it. But it's not true. So I chose a few examples and that is from our, fleet performance management system. Let me just quickly explain. This is a uh, auxiliary engine capacity chart. So if you look at the green line here, it is the baseline. And then the red box is where all the uh, auxiliary engine capacity. So you see that this is all over the capacity. So at that particular time from November to January 2018, the average power demand was 908 kilowatt. So, so, ha so happened that we, our, our services, we have um, given the master some help by giving him a look, 
and saying that, look, you know, you, you are above the scope. Um, can you do something about it? So the alert services actually start in uh, early March in 2018. And you can see the yellow dot now is a lot all behind, uh, below the, the green baseline. So even though, interesting enough, the average power demand was higher than the, than the previous period, but the ship can actually make do with less auxiliary engine capacity. So this is a matter of a small nudge from the third party telling them this is abnormal. And also then the, then it, the seafarers make it a habit to change that. So another example is also um, to do with the main engine. So um, during one of these um, days, we have actually checked that the ship's um, SFOC differences uh, has in increased. So if you look at the chart on the right hand side, the red circle, those are the lines that the data report that we have noticed and thinking is abnormal. So when Upon notification, the masters actually are. Ah, so I have to do something. So he's adjusted the main engine Pmax, and then is within the baseline now, which is the blue dot. So these are examples. So I will see these examples all the time. But then today I'm only showing you two to three. But this particular example now I'm showing is some one of my favorite. And um, so um, even though the cylinder oil is not a big deal in the whole picture, but the reason I show it is I wanted to see how the motivation of the team can actually go a long way. So it all started as also a need to nudge from us and saying that the uh, oil consumption has is our range from 1.7 uh, is now at 1.7. So then the ship staff look at that and then they make some adjustment to become 1.5. So the chief engineer actually was not happy with this result because they still think it was high. And in particular, they re recall that they have just changed the solenoid valve in the last pot. So how can that be? So they, upon further investigation, they've um, took the new valve out and have a look and find that um, by mistake that there was actually a flow valve missing. So they're causing the higher consumption. So now the after all this adjustment, the consumption is actually down to 1.2. So I mean, this is my favorite example because these ship stars actually go a, a further step to check rather than just do stop in stage one, they've actually make, make a difference. So this is what we need. No amount of compliance and no amount of regulation will help with all these small part. So um, to conclude what I wanted to say, so the success really is um, by, by just showing you some uh, average industrial numbers. So, um, for the voyage performance, so that means um, what we can do in terms of weather routine by man managing the speed, plan a better route, the average fuel consumption de decrease will be three to five percent. But if we look at the ship performance, one of them is the how fouling, the favorite subject. I didn't have time to go over that today. And also the what I've gone through today with the consumer performance. So this is not a small numbers. So if you have a fleet of 10, 20, it's all add up. So this, this sort of shows how important the frontline seafarers contribute. So we must motivate and then change mind. So for digitization, actually give us the tools, give us the opportunity to do that. So everything starts with data. So data, you can be a lot of data. Are they very useful? I don't know. So you really have to have a smart and efficient use of that. And plus also um, AI is a good help, but you still, still need the human support. The examples that I showed actually give an example of how these alert to the ship will actually initiate some action. So I, I think these charts are not, you're not stranger to this chart. Uh, the one on the left hand side, the con consumption chart, which is somewhat somewhat funny. If you look at the speed down curve, the consumption consumption curve should be curved up like that. But in terms of the traditional 
reporting all these consumption are a flat liner. So these are data which is not of good quality. So we need to somehow improve on that. And by changing mind, then we can do that. So these data can also be compared with um, auto logger data, which is the graph on the right hand side, but auto logger is not perfect either. So you need to have the perfect configurations and everything. So, so, so everything comes, we need to have AI, we need to have human support, and then everyone have to be very conscious and how, use it, how to use it. But last but not least, I think that's the most important part is we need a supportive culture to change the mindset. And so I think that um, a lot of companies actually already doing it. And, but with now with the new, new, uh, new software, new system, with the communication channel so easily accessible, Everything that we see from the examples, a few few examples that I show, the data can be fed back to the ship, and then the ship can see how they do and how can they improve in time. Not when they come on leave and go to the someone to the office and get a big toad off. So some so corrective action in time is very important, and and very important is this is not a open loop system. Everything needs to feedback and then we have to look and relearn. So we have to keep on this alert report and investigation. So I just hope that Stomp Geo can be part of your plan in doing this. So, so much for now. Thank you. Wow, well, that's fantastic. I think what we've seen here is an amazing vision of how we connect the investment world with the ship operations world. I was just thinking about how many times in our conferences over the last 20 years, people have been lamenting how these worlds are so separate and how in the uh, there's so many things we could do on board ships if any of the investors would support us and maybe we've got a route route to doing that so um i'd like to invite everyone to open the q a box on your computers you, you'll notice that um voice times already answered some of the questions but um maybe we'll start with the questions that haven't been answered and then we'll come back to some of the others perhaps later um so so top on the list um we always get lots of questions about data collection at our events even though we haven't actually discuss that very much but uh, Anton Zakharov has has one up vote you know he's at the top of the list do we need high frequency data or is that something is that within your realm of confidence I don't know if you get involved in data collection on ships um or your is that a well anyways? um uh yes um I think that uh, uh going back to to one of the answers that I, I wrote in the chat I think uh, data collection, uh, as, as, I, as I said, um, a lot of the data is available today, but it's locked down in the different silos. It's locked within the different system. It's it's connected into the navigation system. That's a separate data. It's a communication system. That's where you have the data. Uh, you have the, the data that's collected on the engines. Uh, a lot of those data, they can be kind of liberated uh, because they are available. And the technology to liberate those data uh, into a big data flow is available. And we are trying that out. So we have testing that. Uh, we are able to gather, I was thinking about 20,000 data points every second from one of our vessels, uh, one of our new modern vessels. And we see that the opportunity and possibility for retrofitting both with sensors and data collection uh, systems uh, are really there. But the question is really, uh, do we see the value of actually doing that? Uh, some, some people struggle and are saying, why, why do we need all this data? Uh, 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 and, uh, and I think that it starts there. So you need to be able to see the value of the data. Uh, and, and it has to be high frequency. It has to be high quality uh, and, and, and real time. Uh, in the long run, you could start by just starting to collecting those data and maybe merging those data and contextualize those data. Uh, and then you can uh, open just a, a big Pandora's box of opportunities. So yes, I think that uh, it starts with um, uh, companies uh, really uh, starting to, to believe that the that, that data has value. And then we need to do the sufficient investments in doing that. Those things are not, they, they are not major costs of actually doing that. I think it's more like a, a, a cognitive threshold that you need to, to need to pass. You need to understand and believe that these data can, could have value for you. And then you can connect that. Uh, and then you uh, need to be in dialogue with your providers, engine providers and others, and, and, and see how can we each, how can, how can those, the data be merged within the company, within the ship, and you can get them uh, uh, on shore. And you have the, uh, much more uh, possibilities to, 
to, uh, to analyze it. Uh, and when we are moving now into uh, cloud computing, you make those data available. Those data are available in the cloud and that can easily be shared. So I can easily share data with my engine provider, uh, with pump providers, and, and, and we, can, uh, we can use those data for uh, further efficiency and further improvements. So, um, uh, so we, are, we are on the test phase <laughs> of, of this. Uh, we are able to do that with a, with a small selection of vessels. Uh, and we are building, trying to build good use cases and how this can be scaled up. And we also see that the, the, the possibility to scale that up uh, is there as well. So I think it starts uh, again uh, with the, on the human side that you need, uh, need to realize the value of those data. Uh, and, it, and it would be easier than a lot of people believe to collect those data uh, and, and make use of it. And in the end, uh, that can improve efficiency and improve sustainability. Uh, so, so when we are uh, when I'm talking about that big iPhone moment, I, I think that we're not there, uh, but uh, I think we have the absolute possibility to do, to do so. Yeah, it's incredible. Hey. Oh, go on, Patty. May our perspective, um, in terms of data, we don't have all the varieties, but we do have a lot of ship performance information relating to weather changes and everything so we are in we are in use of these data but then we are also very careful to protect these data uh, origins so um, now with the with the big data with the ai um, in, in artificial intelligence we can actually make good use of these useful information without infringing any, any anyone's right so um, we are routing many ships many voyages at any at one time so those can, can have helped us a lot in preempting the changes in the weather and also the how the ship responds in the sh speed loss response oh, it's an incredibly difficult I mean, not only a technical challenge it's also a modeling challenge putting all these you know getting from having a data about a auto logger to getting a annual efficiency rate for an investor. I mean, there's such a big chain of complexity. I don't think anybody's even done it yet, uh, but, uh, but I suppose talking about the need for it is maybe the first step of, of doing it, isn't it? I don't know, uh, are we anywhere near even technically being able to do this? <laughs> So uh, we are uh, in, in our uh, sustainable finance process, uh, we, uh, we um, set ourselves uh, targets uh, on the AER and the carbon intensity indicator. Uh, uh, and I, I responded earlier why we select the AER. It could have been any other indicator. Um, and, um, and we, first of all, we need to explain how that works also for the investment community. Uh, but now we also need to, to report on that to the investors. So uh, we will now develop a more frequent reporting. We report annually and the progress and that is available is available on our website. The whole, uh, the whole framework is, uh, that we have set is available on our website and also the annual progress reporting uh, on, uh, on our website. And I think that uh, the, uh, a lot of banks now have gone, have been, uh, to, uh, gone together uh, under the Poseidon principles uh, to, uh, to measure their climate alignment of their portfolios. Uh, and they are now also discussing how they can they can collect those data from the different uh, from the different ships and from the different uh, shipping companies uh, where they have uh, where they have where those banks have been financing those vessels. So I think that today uh, companies are using a lot of manual labor uh, on that and, and to respond also to to Stefan's question here on the chat. Uh, today we are having a, a lot of manual controls. Uh, we have a separate team that monitoring all these uh, alarms on, on the fuel. Uh, I think that that is one of the points where I think that we should look at what we should let computers do, what computers are good at. Uh, but we need to have access to high quality data and it's easier to use uh, machine learning or artificial intelligence on top of that to detect anomalies and, and ensure high quality data flows. So we spend a lot of time with preparing the uh, MRV reporting and DCS reporting to, uh, to uh, uh, IMO and to EU uh, and also reporting to the banks. And I think that uh, as soon as you can be able to certify the data flow or high quality data, you can let the computers do that. Uh, and, uh, and the audits of it can be on electronically and you can improve efficiency by doing so. 
Oh, okay. So if we go next to Niels Kjergaard's question, he's asking how you define carbon neutrality. I think offsets are going out of fashion these days. I don't hear much about them, but I guess we're talking about ammonia or hydrogen or some kind of cap carbon capture on board. Is that what? Yes. So, so in our uh, in our plan, in in uh, in our trajectory, uh, that's a AER trajectory uh, that has been based on a fleet transition plan that we have prepared. Uh, the content of the fleet transition plan will be uh, various retrofits, energy improvements, uh, in order to uh, achieve that target. So it does not include any offsets or use of biofuel. Uh, I don't believe that biofuel will be the solution. Uh, it's uh, uh, it's dependent of, of a lot of uh, different factors, whether you consider it from a tank to wake perspective or what kind of carbon reduction factors you want to use. Uh, so I think that uh, biofuel uh, could be an, an opportunity. I, we won't say that that is not, that is not the opportunity. Uh, but um, uh, I think for a full scale shipping, for biofuel, there will be in a, uh, there will be a struggle of producing that amount of biofuel. So, so I don't believe that biofuel will be the the solution. It could be a part of of, of solutions going forward. With regard to offsetting, I think that uh, that is uh, not included in our calculations. Uh, the um, that is something that's heavily discussed discussed at the political level. We expect that uh, there a new regulations from the IMO will come this summer with regards to implementing shipping in the emission trading scheme. We saw China now. Uh, wanted to include shipping in there, the biggest world's biggest emission trading scheme. Uh, we see that uh, that regulation was uh, uh, was also uh, proposed in the US before the election. So with the new administration, it's, it's quite likely that we will see uh, that, that as well. Um, we believe that uh, taxation uh, would be a, 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 a or market-based measures would be a, a very good solution uh, to sort of push for decarbonization, but it has to be done on a global scale, and 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 uh, uh, we believe that that has to be run by IMO. We are concerned about regionalization of regulation that you have a different regulation in different regions, especially for a company like us that operates globally. Oh, sounds great. Okay, so next, Stefan Tunger, who I think is managing director of OSM in Denmark. I think this is perhaps for you, Petty. So he's talking about alerts sent automatically from the system to staff review the alerts before they are sent out. I think it must be alerts going to the ship. I think he's probably asking about. Um, so do we get nonsense get sent to the ships by computers? Or do we... <laughs> I know the answer actually, but it'd be nice to hear from you. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very good question. I'm glad somebody asked it. And so if if the the alert, of course, the front front processing is automatic, but then all the all the uh, alert has to be scrutinized by our expert staff in the performance center in both Hamburg and in Singapore. So they will look at each of them and then actually do a bit of a, um, analysis before we actually send it out. Um, like all those examples I said, the alert was sent at the same time to the ship as well as to the superintendent. So it really depends on who. Sometimes the master would, or the chief engineer would have to deal with it. The other time, maybe the ship, uh, ship managers or the uh, managers have to uh, help out. But we absolutely do not send it out automatically, all of them. Oh, very good. So my colleague Fiona McDonald from Digital Ship is asking Oystein about your experience with fuel cells. Is this something you're personally involved with or is it something in some different part of what well, you're doing uh, this? Well, the, the, the benefits for us of, uh, of being a quite moderate sized company is that we have a, a, a very high skilled technical department uh, and uh, we have various experts. And, and that's the, I would like to say, also say that that's the benefits of uh, being an integrated company because we are our charter, we are a ship owner, we are our, our manager. So, so we have everything in-house. Uh, and that gives us uh, tremendous opportunities and tremendous access to, to, to expertise uh, within many, many different areas. So yes, we are involved in a, in, in a program on the, on the testing of fuel cells. That's not been tested on board one of our vessels, but the plan is that that will be uh, fitted. Uh, we have uh, written several articles on that on our website, so, so that is, uh, that is uh, available. Uh, with regards to alternative fuels, that is a question that we receive a lot. Uh, of course, our, uh, our technical uh, department, they monitor whatever is moving on that. And they have, we have done all, all our analysis of, uh, of kind of energy de de density, risk, uh, and, uh, and possibility. 
And we see that there's a lot of uh, fuss about hydrogen going forward. Uh, and um, I think that hydrogen will be a solution, but uh, we, uh, with uh, hydrogen, uh, we are looking, looking at different uh, uh, hydrogen carriers. So I think that ammonia could be a very, very good hydrogen carrier going forward. But uh, we are, uh, uh, compared to the big scale, we are, we are still a, sm a small company. We're not that, we're only of uh, 100 ships of, uh, out of the uh, uh, 60,000. So for us to take a big bet on the future fuel, that is very, very challenging. So what we are thinking is that we need to focus on flexibility. We need to make sure that the future engines will be fuel flexible, that they can run on a transition fuel that could be LNG. Uh, we don't believe that that would be the zero, and it can't be, of course, the, the, the zero emission uh, fuel, but it could be a transition fuel going there. Uh, we believe that ammonia has a lot of good characteristics uh, and uh, but uh, it is it is challenging for us to make make a big bet. So we are kind of betting on being as flexible as possible, because the major challenge would be on the infrastructure side. And everyone is talking about ammonia and green ammonia. And I think that uh, be a, the ability to produce uh, a, a commercial volumes of green ammonia. I think we're still talking about many many years ahead. Uh, yeah, you must be following Equinor's work. They're doing maritime hydrogen-based fuels, aren't they? That's probably quite yeah, interesting. Yeah, it, it, it's interesting to see the developments and, and then kind of the piloting uh, of their hub in the UK there. But uh, uh, but um, uh, on, a, on a kind of commercial scale for global shipping going forward, uh, that is be, uh, that would be um, interesting to see. And uh, as I mentioned in one of the chats earlier, uh, um, it's also a price issue. Uh, global shipping is uh, is quite competitive and a very low margin. So, so that means that we we need to have equal playing field, and we will not be able to to be able to pay twice the amount of uh, of fuel uh, than our competitors if you don't have to. So this this has to be either has to be regulated or it, the market has to be adjusted so that uh, an alternative fuel uh, is competitive to uh, a, a another possible compliant fuel. Oh, that's very good. So we come back to Petty on this question of data, because I mean, it's very fascinating. I mean, you're probably as networked as any other company in the world and different types of data related to sustainability. And we've seen Oyston's spoken very clearly about what he wants to get. And uh, I'm quite intrigued about whether or not you can give it to him. But it's so complicated. And we've just seen this discussion about different sort of indexes and some of them cover different things and give incentives in different ways. And somehow this data provider in the middle has to put data in, in the format that people want. Is this something you're able to do now or are we still talking about something, still obstacles to get over before you can do it, do you think? That's a daily nightmare. Well, <laughs> everyone has a different, different type of format. And then, um, so, I mean, to, to be able to utilize this data, you really, really, you really need to look at, um, uh, overcome, overcome these challenges first. But I think it's important that to distinguish good quality data, not, um, not, not necessarily if you have more data, then it's good. For example, with the uh, high frequency data, so we you collect it every few seconds or 10 seconds. Do they do you use all of them? Uh, so how do you balance out all these things? So um, if there is some some uh, some company who may not want to do an initial investment of setting up all those hard hardware, then there is also alternatives as well. For example, we sort of uh, initiate this snapshot report. So these snapshot reports will act as a random check on your reported data. So that will give very good, good idea how the engine performs. So there is a lot of challenges that we are over, overcoming every day. So, but then we are, we are so fast integrating all this in one platform in order to be able to help. But the, I think, I think the, the data belongs to those people who generate it, but we wanted to make use of it in an anonymous, anonymous way. So that is another big challenge. And so like the way that uh, Einstein created these saving reports, which is amazing. So you cannot do it without some in-house knowledge. So we can only do it in one level. So without other information, we cannot produce um, comprehensive one, like how Einstein can do for their for their own fleet. So we we are open to help customers, and so to do what whatever we can. 
Yeah. I mean, I mean, the scale of the challenge, I guess, we're just even seeing now. I mean, there's totally different challenges gathering data from a ship and then the next stage when you bundle it all up. You know, I was quite surprised. I was looking at EEDI. There's no way to bring in weather routing to EEDI because EEDI just covers the, the power of the ship. I was quite surprised to learn about that yesterday, but nobody seems too bothered about that. I suppose there's other indicators that <laughs> the bringing the carbon intensity. I, I suppose maybe there's not much more to say about this, just that we need to all understand how, how hard a challenge this is. I, I know, really... the, the EEDI is more to do with the design index. Yeah. So uh, what Songjiu set up is to help with the operations. So with what, uh, like the AER, there is part, certainly part of it that we, we, can, we can help. So um, don't forget the shipping, besides reducing com, um, emission, we still have a commercial interest to fulfill. So it depends on how the ship was being operated, what business model for that particular voyage. You cannot always do the same thing. For example, um, if you, I mean, of course, if you don't move, then then you have zero emission. It's like <laughs> last year, 2000, 2020, I think the emission has dropped in, um, so significantly. But um, so we, that's why we now, now looking at routing in a holistic way. So it's not just one way. I mean, when I first started in the industry, it's always like the shortest route, shortest time. It's not always like that now. So you have to balance what is the charter higher rate, what is your fuel consumption, and then whether you have a commitment to make, whether you need to arrive at a port at a particular time. So it's a lot more complex. So, but then our philosophy may be a little bit different from most of uh, a lot of uh, other company is like everybody have a system. But we have our expertise behind who can sort of analyze, just like the questions that the other gentlemen ask, whether we're looking at the alert before we actually automatically answer them. So we pride ourselves in having the human expertise behind. Well, that's great. Well, we're coming up to the hour now. So maybe we'll close the Q&A. Maybe if, if you'd like to make any, any closing remarks, maybe Oyston first and then Petty, like a minute. Yeah, I think um, uh, I, I, uh, we, we're talking a lot about the challenges uh, here and the challenges and risk. But, uh, but I wanted to, to, to sort of kind of leave on the on opportunity side. Uh, and that's why my, my point as well. I think that uh, our efforts uh, on sustainability, being able to link it to financing, have reduced our capital cost. We have seen tremendous opportunities by... Uh, by doing something uh, no one had done in our industry uh, previously. Uh, so that is a great opportunity. I mean, we, can, we will still uh, investigate uh, how we can link financing and how that can be merged together. And, and also with the taxonomy moving in the EU, uh, we will also see uh, developments on that. So I see that there's tremendous opportunities there. Uh, we're going to solve one of the major problems that we uh, uh, that we don't have a, a great solution uh, for today. And, and we're going to solve that. That gives fantastic opportunities for young people, for, for new thinking, for new technology. Uh, we're going to, uh, to decarbonize shipping going forward and we need to do that. Uh, and so if you're going to work within our industry, they, this is really, really uh, amazing times. And I think uh, um, uh, uh, Larry Fink, the CEO of Bloomberg, he, uh, he wrote to his, all his CEOs and saying, well, this is, uh, this is the historic investment opportunity going forward with the opportunities that uh, that's I had. And also my points on my kind of reflections and thoughts on, on, uh, on data and data sharing. I think that we are, as I said, uh, the moment when we have those data available, today we don't really know how to do that and how to handle it and what to get out of it. But as soon as we get it, uh, it's possible to, to, uh, to see great opportunities. And then we get, get, can get new players coming in to sort of, uh, and tell us, uh, hey guys, this is what you can do with all this data. Look at the value it can bring. So uh, we're going to see new technology in engines. We're going to see further digitalization. We're going to see integration of financing. Uh, we're going to see new talents coming on board, uh, thinking new ideas. So uh, I wanted to leave on a high note uh, with regards to the challenge that we have discussed today. Well, that's absolutely fantastic. I don't know, Petty, you can do anything to add to that. That was... <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, I think that uh, I, I can't. I can't agree more because the shipping. I, I my experience, we always have a bad rap, you know. But then actually, there is a lot of things that we have done, and also like Onsen have rightly pointed out that it is a very efficient in terms of um, emission uh, weight of transportation. 
but nobody just think, nobody just realized that. So now it's an opportunity for us to actually really go out and tell people what we can do and do really do something. And I'm more, I'm more um, encouraged now working with uh, with the customers, the seafarers in the front line, um, with those examples I, I showed you. And so we are actually helping these people to to get to uh, make make their effort known for people like uh, Einstein in the company because that, that that is the small effort that everyone does and that uh, so so in our part of our data we also link may we could actually link the performance of individuals kind of in a way to how much they have done in terms of emission or initiatives so this this will this will help and then we're always doing that Oh, this is the most upbeat webinar we've ever done, I think. So I'll pass back to Vida for the closing words. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Carl. So there were about 200 of you connected today. We hope you picked up some ideas how you can get closer to your decarbonization goals. Two days from now, on Thursday, we will present you a case study from REM Offshore, how they use wireless communications on board. Register, the topic is relevant for you. And now digital ship is switching off. Be safe. Bye. Bye-bye.